so thanks everyone for uh, listening today. Um, so my presentation will be providing an overview of the southern region's economy and looking at the regional economic impact of COVID-19. Uh, my name is John Daly and I'm the economist of the Regional Assemblies of Ireland. The structure of today's presentation is as follows. Uh, section 1 will provide an overview of the southern region's economy. Uh, section 2 will look at the regional economic impact of COVID-19. Uh, section 3 will look at how we as an assembly is responding to the impact uh, with smart specialization strategies or as you know it as uh, S3. And in section four then we'll give a brief example of ongoing work from the assembly which incorporates the principles of uh, S3. So section one will provide a, an overview of the southern region's economy. So in absolute terms um, the southern region's uh, GDP per head of population amounted to 77,794 euro in 2018 which is the latest available figures. Uh, figure one shows GDP per head of population uh, for Ireland and the Southern region as a percentage of the EU 27 average, uh, using Eurostat figures between 2008 and 2018. Uh, as evident from figure uh, one, the Southern region's GDP per head of population, and as indicated by the blue bar, has improved notably compared to the EU average in recent years jumping from 127% of the EU27 average in 2014 to 225% in 2018, to a point where GDP per head of population in the southern region is now above the corresponding average for Ireland as a whole. Although it is clear that the southern region's GDP has improved in recent years, uh, based on trends and other economic indicators, in reality, the southern region's economy has not grown as fast as presented in figure one. The dramatic uplift in the southern region's GDP figures is due to the distortionary activities of a small set of multinational companies within the state, which have significantly inflated the southern and the eastern midland region's GDP figures from 2015 onwards. Uh, due to international reporting procedures, uh, such activities have artificially inflated GDP figures for the southern region and the state as a whole from 2015 onwards, as evident from the spike in the green bar and the blue bar uh, in figure one. Such activities, which range from everything from the importation of intellectual property assets uh, to changes in the legal structure of multinational companies, have significantly inflated the GDP headline figures for the southern and eastern Midland region, with such activities in reality having little impact on the domestic economies of these regions. On this basis, it is clear that while the region's economy has improved in recent years, uh, trends in the southern region's GDP per head of population since 2015 do not reflect the actual performance of the region's overall economy. With this in mind, it's important to look at other economic indicators when reviewing the southern region's uh, economy, with one such indicator being employment. So as of uh, Q2 2020, a total employment in the southern region amounted to 714,500. As evident from the blue bars in figure two, employment in the southern region has grown since the Irish economy has began to recover in 2012, increasing from just over 618,000 in Q1 2012 to 714,500 in Q2 2020, representing employment growth of 15.5%, which is below the corresponding national growth rate of 19.3% in this time period. As the share of total employment in Ireland, which is evident from the red line in figure two, the southern region's employment base has generally accounted for about a third of employment in the state, with this share holding over the past number of years. As well as looking at, at employment, it's also important to review the high level sectorial composition of such employment. As we can see from the graphic, services accounted for 75.4% of employment in the southern region in Q2 2020, highlighting how the region in line with the Irish economy as a whole, is predominantly a service-driven economy, albeit to a lesser extent compared to the national norm. Uh, relative to the state as a whole, the southern region is more reliant on employment in the agricultural, forestry and fishery sector, and the industrial sector, uh, which would largely consist of manufacturing activities, while the southern region is in line with the national average in terms of construction activity. 
Furthermore, it should be also important to examine the degree to which the technology and knowledge intensive economy contributes to employment in the southern region. Uh, in this context, it's, it's widely accepted that economic growth in leg leading regional economies are increasingly being driven by firms operating within the technology and knowledge intensive economy and will continue to do so in the coming years. Uh, the technology and knowledge intensive economy is not just about, say, high tech companies involved in, say, the ICT sector, but rather it captures a far more a high valued economic activities, ranging from uh, financial and insurance services, uh, professional, scientific, and technical services, high end manufacturing activities, education, human health, and social work services. Uh, data that captures such employment is available via your staff is, and is presented in Figure 4. Uh, specifically, Figure 4 outlines employment in the technology and knowledge intensive economy as a share of total employment in the southern region, the EU27, and for Ireland as a whole. As evident from Figure 4, employment in the technology and knowledge intensive economy accounted for 44.9% of total employment in the southern region in 2019. This was marginally below the corresponding EU27 average of 45.2%, and the Irish average of 48.6%. Another important element from reviewing the region's economy is the degree to which it exports. So figure five shows the export intensity for the southern region and each of its sub-regions compared to the national average as per the latest available data in this regard. Specifically, export intensity is the degree to which turnover in exporting companies can be credited to exports. So, for example, if a region recorded an export intensity of 100%, this means that turnover from its exporting companies are completely reliant on exports. As evident from Figure 5, the Midwest is the most export oriented sub region in the southern region and is also the most export oriented sub region in all of Ireland, recording an export intensity of 85.6%. With a ratio of 85.6%, this implies that 85.6% of turnover from exporting companies that are based in the Midwest can be credited to exports. Export intensity for the Southeast, the Southern region as a whole, and the Southwest were below the national average, albeit all three recorded an export intensity above 70%. Taking all these factors into account, it's important to consider the actual income of households across the region. As of 2019, the median household income in the southern region was €41,612, which was below the corresponding uh, national median of €42,183. Figure 6 goes further and shows the median household income for all eight sub-regions of Ireland compared to the national median, as per the latest available figures, which was 2019. Of the sub-regions of the southern region, the Southwest had the highest median household income at €44,281, with this being the only sub region in the Southern region to record a median household income above the corresponding state median. This is followed by the Midwest at €41,287, and in the Southeast, which registered the second lowest median household income in the state. So, to summarize, the Southern region's economy. Uh, the, re the region's GDP per capita has no doubt improved in recent years based on trends in other economic indicators, but not to the extent as reflected in the region's distorted GDP figures. The region accounted for about a third of uh, employment in Ireland, and its employment base is largely service driven. The degree to which the region relies on employment from the technology and knowledge intensive economy which is a core principle or a component of the overall economy, is also in line with the EU27 average, albeit marginally below. The region, particularly the Midwest, is quite export oriented, while median household income remains below the national median due to a varied performance at a sub regional level, with median household income in the Southwest rising above the corresponding national median in the past year, while the Southeast has the second lowest. Uh, median household income in the state on a sub regional level. So moving on, section two will now look at the regional economic impact of COVID 19, looking at up to date data and how the region's economy has been affected. Uh, specifically, we'll be looking at this from two perspectives. Uh, firstly, the impact of COVID 19 on the region's labour market, 
and in the exposure of the region's commercial market. Uh, although the economic impact of COVID-19 will have affected a variety of regional socioeconomic indicators, uh, such as poverty and household income, uh, data that captured the impact of COVID-19 on these indicators are simply not available at the moment. So we'll focus on these high-level indicators for the moment. So now we'll look at the labour market impact of COVID-19. So figure seven shows the total number of people in the southern region that have been receipt of the pandemic unemployment payment between the 22nd of March 2020 and the 27th of September 2020, which was the latest available figures at the time of writing. As of the 27th of September, the number of residents in the southern region in receipt of the pandemic unemployment payment was just over 57,000 accounting for just over a quarter of total claimants in Ireland. This represents a notable drop compared to the original peak at the beginning of May, with just over 193,000 residents in the southern region were in receipt of the pandemic unemployment payment. Figure 8 then shows the total number of people in the southern region that have been in receipt of the temporary wage subsidy scheme between the 22nd of March 2020 and the 6th of September which is the latest available CSO data set before the scheme closed. The number of residents in the southern region in receipt of the temporary, temporary wage subsidy scheme peaked at the end of May at just over 108,000 people, with the number of claimants ranging from 100,000 to 80,000 between then and the time the, key, the scheme was closed at the start of September. The substantial drop in recent weeks is due to the fact that the temporary wage subsidy scheme was replaced by the employment wage subsidy scheme. On the 1st of September 2020. Uh, since the scheme has been closed, there was no more claimants beyond the 6th of September. And the CSO has yet to receive or release employment wage subsidy scheme data as of the writing of this presentation. Nevertheless, due to the uh, economic impact of the uh, pandemic, it's likely that these figures will vary depending on the public health measures required. But nevertheless, such developments have already have severely affected the southern region's labour market and its unemployment rate. However, to what extent remains to be seen, considering the lack of official uh, regional unemployment rate statistics that capture both the number of residents in receipt of the pandemic unemployment payment, the temporary wage subsidy scheme, or those that were just registered on the live register. So to combat this, the Southern Regional Assembly has adopted a similar methodology to recently release Central Bank of Ireland research, which examines the degree to which geographical areas, labour forces, were reliant on some kind of government income support, namely either the pandemic unemployment payment, a, the temporary wage subsidy scheme of residents that were registered in the live register. Uh, using this approach, the Southern Region Assembly, on a regional level, expressed the number of residents on some kind of government income support as of the 28th of June 2020 as a share of each region's corresponding labour force as of Q2 2020. As evident from the previous slides, you know, there is more up-to-date data in terms of government income supports, but it's appropriate to compare data sets of similar timeframes. Hence why we are using in the Q2 2020 uh, government income support data and Q2 2020 regional labour force data, uh, which is the latest available data set in this regard. Therefore, figure nine shows the share of each NUT's two regions' labour force in receipt of some kind of government income support as of Q2 2020. And as of Q2 2020, 38.6% uh, of the southern region's labour force were in receipt of some kind of government income support, highlighting the sheer impact of COVID-19 on the region's economy. Uh, this was marginally below the corresponding national ratio of 39.9%. Figure 10 goes further and breaks this data down on a sub-regional level. As of Q2 2020, 43% of the Southeast labour force were in receipt of some kind of government income support. This is above the corresponding national ratio of 39.9%, uh, and the second highest ratio recorded out of the eight sub-regions of Ireland. Although the ratio for the Midwest at 39.3% and the Southwest at 35.5% were below the corresponding national ratio, these figures nevertheless highlight the substantial impact of COVID-19 on their labour markets. So moving on, this subsection will now specifically look at the exposure of the southern region's commercial market using the latest data uh, from the Regional Assemblies of Ireland's publication titled uh, COVID-19 Regional Economic Analysis. 
uh, using the geodirectory commercial database and specifically the NACE codes allocated to commercial units as of September 2019, the COVID-19 regional economic analysis identified each geographical area's reliance on the sectors that are likely to be severely affected by the public health measures. To achieve this, COVID-19 exposure ratios were developed for each of Ireland's regions, sub-regions, counties, cities, and 199 CSO-defined settlements. Specifically, a geographical area's COVID-19 exposure ratio represents the total number of its commercial units that were operating in the sectors likely to be worst affected by the COVID-19 outbreak, as a share of its total commercial stock as of September 2019. The higher this ratio is for a geographical area, the more likely this geographical area's commercial market is exposed to significant economic disruption as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak, as many firms in these sectors are likely to be severely impacted from this crisis. As evident from Figure 11, the Southern Region recorded a COVID-19 exposure ratio of 47.2%. This means that 47.2% of the Southern Region's commercial market were operating in the worst affected sectors implying that just over 27,000 of its businesses were likely to be severely impacted as a result of the outbreak of COVID-19 and due to the necessary public health measures. This is above the corresponding uh, COVID-19 exposure ratio for the state as a whole, which was 46%. Uh, figure 11 also shows that all three sub-regions of the southern region recorded COVID-19 exposure ratios above the national average. Uh, figure 12 goes further and shows the COVID-19 exposure ratios of the nine counties based in the southern region. Of the nine counties, six recorded above average COVID-19 exposure ratios, with the highest expo exposure ratio in the region and in the state as a whole recorded in Kerry, with 53.8% of its commercial units likely to be severely impacted as a result of the public health measures. From a southern region perspective, the next highest were Clare and Wexford, where 50.4% of their commercial units are likely to be severely impacted as a result of the outbreak of COVID-19. Of the 14 key towns and key cities outlined in the Southern Regional Assembly's recess, 11 recorded COVID-19 exposure ratios above the national average, uh, namely Killarney, Gorey, Kilkenny, Wexford Town, Carlow Town, Clonmel, Clonakilty, Innes, Dungarvan, Mallow and Tralee as evident from figure 13. Although all three cities within the region registered COVID-19 exposure ratios below the national average, such data shows that nearly 40% of commercial units in the southern region's cities were exposed to significant economic disruption. Therefore, taking into account these findings of the previous section, we will now move into how the Southern Region Assembly has been responding to the economic downturn and how we feel that a S3 should be a key component into ensuring economic recovery can be achieved in the region. In this context, the Southern Region Assembly made a submission on the National Economic Recovery Plan to the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment, outlining how the Southern Region has been impacted and how we feel economic recovery can be achieved in our region. Within the actual submission, the Southern Region Assembly highlighted the economic impact of COVID-19 on our region, specifically in terms of the statistics you've just seen, but we've also outlined the series of high-level priorities to ensure an inclusive economic recovery can be achieved in the region. The priorities that we outlined in the submission to the department were categorised by three ambitions of our recess. Firstly, the need to become Europe's most creative and innovative region. Secondly, to become Europe's most livable region. And in thirdly, to become one of Europe's most greenest regions. As you'll see from the graphic, a total of 11 high-level priorities were outlined in the submission to the department, with our first priority aiming to ensure there is a regional approach to S3 in Ireland, as we feel this will be key to ensuring inclusive economic recovery that is in line with the objectives and the vision of our recess. Uh, using S3 is in line with the economic strategy of the Southern Region Assembly's recess. Uh, the economic strategy of the re region is based on five key principles, as evident from the graphic on the right-hand side, one of which would include the economic principle of smart specialization. In this regard, the Assembly feels that building on our region's unique competitive advantages, which is central to S3, will be key to rebuilding our region's economy. 
This is evident from a recent report from the Economic and Public Policy Consultancy. Insights from this report highlight the need for more regionally uh, focused smart specialization strategies and the importance of the regions and the recess in this regard. Specifically, the report notes three key points. Firstly, Ireland's approach to S3 is strongly centrally driven by the national government, and as a consequence, it lacks sensitivity to and awareness of local issues. Secondly, the recesses offer an opportunity to reorientate the country's S3 governance with a stronger place-based focus. And thirdly, a place-based emphasis generates value by identifying and connecting the many local examples of excellence which exist across the country, which are often not very visible. Therefore, by bringing a regional dimension to Ireland's economic recovery process through a regional approach to S3, policymakers can, can utilise funding resources in a far more efficient manner, allowing regions to utilise self-identified competitive advantages for the economic benefit of their own geographical areas. Uh, furthermore, it's imperative that a regional approach to S3 is developed to allow us to achieve a variety of RPOs in the recess. Uh, including RPO 51, 67, 69, and 75. So to wrap up, I felt it was important that we highlighted an example of how the principles of S3 is being practiced in the southern region through the Learning Region Action Plan. So as part of the implementation of the Southern Regional Assembly's economic strategy, the Assembly is developing a Learning Region Action Plan which will be a policy paper on how to enhance the Southern region's skills base and very much utilises the S3 approach to policymaking. The Learning Region Action Plan will essentially aim to do three things. Firstly, we want to explore what is needed to develop the Southern region's skills and talent and education proposition. Secondly, we want to explore what is needed to respond to the economic impact of COVID-19 from a skills, lifelong learning and education perspective. And thirdly, we want to explore what is needed to support the current activities of the Learning City initiatives in the Southern region. We'll also explore how similar initiatives could be expanded to other urban centres within the Southern region. By applying the principles of S3 to the Learning Region Action Plan, uh, myself and my colleagues Brian Riney and Dominic Walsh have been meeting key stakeholders in the education and training sectors, uh, getting their thoughts on how to tackle these areas. Uh, using stakeholder input and up-to-date data, the Learning Region Action Plan will make a series of recommendations to policymakers on how to tackle these issues. So the graphic on the screen then shows the organisations we have been uh, meeting in, in this regard in terms of the Learning Region Action Plan. Uh, specifically, we met a large number of representatives from the Education and Training Boards, the Regional Skills Forum, uh, third level institutes, uh, universities, institutes of technology, all based in the Southern Region getting their insights on how, we, how they feel the skills proposition of the region can be enhanced, how they feel that we can tackle the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, economically speaking, from a skills perspective, and how we could grow the region using the learning cities. Uh, we've also met individuals that have involved in the learning city initiatives as well. Uh, by getting these stakeholders' insights and com by combining this information with up-to-date data, uh, we feel the Learning Region Action Plan uh, very much utilises the S3 approach to policymaking, allowing the Southern Regional Assembly to make a series of recommendations to policymakers in the areas of skills development, which could enhance the region's human capital levels and could enhance the economic prospects of the Southern Region. Uh, so thanks very much uh, for listening.